Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome our radio audience, City Club members and their guests to the regular Friday program of the City Club of Portland. I'm Mary Kramer, president of the club. First of all, I'd like to introduce our new members. I'll ask them to stand as I call their names and I'll ask you to hold your applause until all have inter been introduced. First of all, we have Jillian Abendroth, Executive Secretary, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. Next is Irma August, Program Coordinator, Albina Youth Opportunity School, Genesis. Robin Hyatt, Oasis Director for Good Samaritan Hospital. James LeBlanc, President, Volunteers of America, Incorporated. Next is J. Michael Melkirk, attorney with Lane Powell Spears Laberski. Next is Judith Romilly, president, Portland State University. And finally, Kathleen Sayor, attorney, Lane Powell Spears Laberski. Please join me in welcoming them. I'd like to thank City Club members who recruited these new members. They are Kay Duran, Gladys McCoy, Sharon Padgett, Vicki Flommer, and James Westwood. We appreciate your work. We'll start with a few announcements. Next Friday, September 14th, Ted Savinar, nationally known Portland artist, will speak on what it means to be a professional artist. He is co-creator of the stage production, Talk Radio, which was made into a movie by Oliver Stone. His artwork is represented in the permanent collection of New York City's Museum of Modern Art and the Smithsonian's American Archives. We'll be here in the Benson Hotel in the Mayfair Room. Two weeks from today, Friday, September 21, Sharon Rodine, president of the National Women's Political Caucus, will be with us. She'll speak on women, political leaders for the 90. Rodine, who has been called the new feminist, will discuss what it will take for women in the 90s to move into the public sector leadership roles and into the public, excuse me, political pipeline. Please note for this program, will be over at U.S. Bank Corp Tower, 41st floor. Three weeks from today, Friday, September 28th, brings a special program, Convention Center, the heart of development on Portland's east side. We'll be on site at the new Convention Center for this program. A distinguished panel composed of Sam Brooks, who is president of Oregon Association of Minority Entrepreneurs, Larry Troyer, General Manager of Lloyd Center, and Pat LaCrosse, Executive Director of Portland Development Commission, will be our speakers. We have arranged free transportation on Max for this program. Look for the details in the bulletin. Last week we announced that City Club and Merrill Hurst College have joined forces. We want to remind you of that today to let you know that it's an exciting program 
This course will be presented for 10 weeks. You can get graduate or undergraduate credit for it. And it's an issue-based seminar which will focus on City Club speakers. Students will come to our Friday programs, then adjourn to the club office where they will talk about what they have heard that day. We've already been told that some of our speakers during that period will join the class. So it's really gonna be an exciting uh, class to be in to have the speakers come and join with you. Uh, they're gonna limit this enrollment. So if you're interested, call now. You should call Merrill Hurst Student Services and that number is 636-8141. Now for today's program. Harry Lonsdale is here to discuss his candidacy for the United States Senate. As was announced in our bulletin, Senator Hatfield, the Republican candidate and incumbent, was invited to participate. Under city club policy, should one candidate decline the club's invitation, the other candidate is allowed to appear alone. Harry Lonsdale, the Democratic candidate accepted the club's invitation. The incumbent, Mark Hatfield, declined. The format today, for today is that Mr. Lonsdale will give a 10-minute opening statement. Following that, two city club panelists will ask a series of questions of Mr. Lonsdale. These questions were prepared by the club's program committee. On the panel, our Marge Kafori, Director of Governmental Affairs for the City of Portland, and Vivian Solomon, Attorney with Lane Powell Spears Lebersky. Both are members of the club's program committee. I also want to thank Kathy Oxborough, Member of the Board of Governors and Executive Assistant for the Oregon Commission for the Blind, for serving as our timekeeper today. After the club panelists com complete their questioning, City Club members will have the opportunity to also ask questions. There will be a mic in the center of the room. You will have 30 seconds to ask your questions. Mr. Lonsdale will have one minute to respond to those questions. We will end at 1.10 so that Mr. Lonsdale will have an opportunity to give closing remarks. Please join me in welcoming today Marge Kafori and Vivian Solomon and the Democratic candidate for the U.S. Senate, Harry Lonsdale. Thank you very much, Mary. And I want to say a special thanks to the City Club for inviting Senator Hatfield and me to attend here today. When I joined the City Club just a few months ago, I had no idea that this was one of the privileges attendant there, too. I want to use this opportunity to present to you my views on what I feel are the important issues facing Oregon and our nation. And I'm happy to take your questions. But before this campaign is over, I hope to have the opportunity to debate Mark Hatfield in person and to discuss real issues one-on-one -on -one with him. Several leading Oregon newspapers have asked Mr. Hatfield to enter into a debate with me. <clears throat> Your Oregonian here in Portland, the Eugene Register Guard, and the uh, Medford Mail Tribune. And I hope he answers that call and will face me in debate. But since he's not here today, I intend to debate Mark Hatfield's record. It's a record that's out of step with Oregon. You know, like many of you, I voted for Mark Hatfield in the past, but the world is changing, and I will make the case today that we need new leadership, fresh ideas, and new blood in the U.S. Senate. This election is about change, and I'm running for the Senate because I'm tired of the mess in Washington, a mess Mark Hatfield can't change because he doesn't see the problem. We need to change a system that has burdened us with a $3 trillion debt and a savings and loan scandal that will cost each Oregonian upwards of $2,000. Change from a system in which big special interests increasingly control this country and its politicians. A system in which greedy SNL executives get away while we get stuck with the bill. 
a system where George Weyerhaeuser exports our raw logs and we pay for it with our jobs. A system where the rich have gotten richer, the poor have gotten poorer, and the middle class squeezed more in the last decade than perhaps at any time in Oregon's history. Mark Hatfield is part of that system. I'm not. As you know, I'm not a politician and I've never run for political office before. I'm a scientist and a businessman. I started a high-tech company in Bend some 15 years ago. And at Bend Research, we've created new jobs and created new technologies. Today, Bend Research is one of America's leading research and technology companies, pioneering new efforts to clean our air, purify our water, and reduce our dependence on toxic pesticides. My friends think of me as a doer. When I see things I don't like, I don't just complain about them, I act. In the early 1980s, I started the Great Oregon Spring Cleanup, a roadside litter cleanup campaign in Central Oregon that now attracts about 2,000 people each year. I was also a co-sponsor of the Oregon Rivers Initiative in 1988, and I've served for two years as co-chair of Governor Goldschmidt's Science Council. I'm also a father and a grandfather, and I hope that we can pass on to my grandson Douglas, who's just three years old, a world that's a little bit better than the one we inherited. But to do that, we need change, because the system that we have now of business as usual just isn't working. Mr. Hatfield's absence from this debate today is typical of the way he sees the issues facing us. He sees no need for change, no need for fresh ideas or new approaches, indeed, no need for a debate. I say we need new blood and a new senator. On the issue of a woman's right to choose the option of a safe and legal abortion, Mr. Hatfield is stuck in the past. Mark Hatfield is the co-sponsor of a constitutional amendment that would ban the right of choice, even in cases of rape and incest. In the last 10 years alone, he's voted 25 times with Jesse Helms on the Senate floor to ban the right of choice. Today, with Judge Souter's appointment pending before the Senate, that right is threatened the new Supreme Court could overturn Roe v. Wade. A woman's right to choose could be taken away, and her only hope may be in new laws written by the next Senate. Should those laws be written by Jesse Helms and Mark Hatfield, or should Oregon send a new senator to Washington dedicated to the fundamental right of every woman to choose for herself? I'm pro-choice, and I trust the women of Oregon to make their own decisions. When it comes to Oregon's economy, our jobs, and our future, Mark Hatfield must be held accountable. As the man with principal jurisdiction over the management of our national forests, and as ranking minority member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Mark Hatfield must be accountable for his role. His actions have polarized our state as never before over this timber issue. We've lost thousands of timber jobs and our environment has deteriorated substantially during Mr. Hatfield's 24 years in office. Mark Hatfield now says he needs six more years to try to find a balance to our timber problem. I ask a simple question, what has he been doing with the last 24 years? Workers can't take six more years of dwindling jobs, and our environment can't stand six more years of destroying our ancient forests. His policies has failed us on both counts. We need a new approach to the timber industry. We need to create new jobs manufacturing wood products here in Oregon. We've got to have an all-out ban on log exports now. No loopholes and no exceptions. George Weyerhaeuser and Georgia Pacific need to know the quick profits made by selling logs to Japan are costing us jobs. We want a total export ban, and we mean it. Not one more log, not one more job lost. Finally, there's the question of who Mr. Hatfield really represents. In the last 10 years, Senator Hatfield has accepted money from over 300 special interest PACs. He's taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from PACs, from toxic polluters, from savings and loans, and especially from big timber industry PACs. When you have hundreds of thousands of dollars of special interest money in your pocket, it's hard to say no to those special interests, and Mark Hatfield hasn't. 
We need to remove the grip that special interests have over the politicians in Washington. Mark Hatfield can't do that because like most of our politicians today, he too is caught in their grip. This country desperately needs real campaign finance reform. Not only have incumbents become increasingly difficult to replace because of all the special interest money they pile up, but they become the property of those special interests. The Congress has been addressing this very problem in recent weeks. In the Senate, they voted to place spending limits on campaigns. They voted to, in they, they voted to reduce in special interests, the influence of special interests. They voted overwhelmingly to ban special interest speaking fees, those so-called honoraria, from big corporations and special interest groups. But Mark Hatfield couldn't change. He was one of only 23 senators who voted against the ban on special interest speaking fees. Now that's no surprise when you realize that he takes an average of over $30,000 each year in speaking fees. That's more than the median Oregon household income. Here again, I believe we need new leadership. I'm not accepting any special interest PAC money in my campaign so that I can be free to represent all Oregonians, not just big oil companies, big polluters, and big timber companies. I want to fight for the rest of us. <laughs> the SNL scandal is just one example of what I'm talking about here. They say it will cost $500 billion to fix it. That's two or three thousand dollars for each and every one of us. It happened because the politicians in Washington were looking out for themselves. They were looking out for campaign money. They were looking out for speaking fees, but they weren't looking out for us. They were asleep at the switch. They gutted the regulatory mechanism. They changed the rules and then cut the budgets of the people who were there to enforce the rules. This is a system, friends, that isn't working for you and me. It's a system that won't be changed or fixed by more of the same. The spirit of freedom that has guided our country through its proudest, most noble moments will soar again. But it needs rejuvenation. Our democracy needs a breath of fresh air. The challenges of the future demand nothing less. And the quality of life we leave our children demands nothing less. You know, we Oregonians are distinguished in our desire for fair play and independence. We're resolved to protect the rights of individuals. We're resolved to change things that aren't working. As your senator, I pledge to you I'll never forget who I am, where I came from, or who sent me there. 24 years ago, Mark Hatfield left Oregon for Washington, D.C. 24 years later, he opposes the individual right of a woman to choose. 24 years ago, Mark Hatfield fought the special interests. 24 years later, he takes special interest money by the hundreds of thousands. 24 years ago, Mark Hatfield fought to change a system that wasn't working. 24 years later, he fights to protect a system that isn't working at all. It's time for new blood, for fresh ideas and new approaches. It's time, just as it was 24 years ago, for someone to fight for the rest of us. Thank you very much. We'll now have questions from our panel. Vivian Solomon will ask the first question. Vivian? Healthcare. Healthcare is rapidly taking a bigger and bigger bite out of the nation's gross national product. Do you think the federal government has a role in containing health care costs? If so, what is this role? I believe the federal government does have some role. You're right, health care costs have, have, have become intolerable in this country. I believe it said we spend 12 percent of our GNP on health care. The Canadians, with health care for all, spend only like 7 or 8 percent. We have some 37 million Americans without guaranteed medical insurance in this country. It's, it's criminal. Only I think the United States and South Africa are the only two industrialized countries in the world without medical care for all. We need it. What we've done in my company in Bend is provide free medical insurance for all of our employees and their dependents. I think we need more of that all across this country. We need companies to take up the role. But if they can't, if there are people who aren't employed anywhere, I think it's the federal government's role to see that they do have adequate medical care. Marge Kafori will ask the second question. 
The savings and loan bailout promises to cost American taxpayers even more than the Vietnam War. Your position on this issue appears to be to prosecute the perpetrators and make sure the bailout is done fairly. How would those actions help to reduce the cost of the bailout? And what would you do to prevent the same occurrence with other lending institutions? Unfortunately, I'm not sure we can reduce the cost of the bailout very much. It is what it is. Now, we, we will go after some of the people who swipe the money, and I hope bring them to justice and collect some of the money back, but that will be a small fraction of what this country has lost, this $500 billion, and it may be even more, people claim, over the next 10 or 20 years as more major losses are uncovered. It's not, it's not recoverable, I'm afraid. We will just have to pay for it. We will pay for it because of the oversight of the people back in Washington, I believe. They just look the other way. And that's understandable when you realize that many of them take money from special interests. Mark Hatfield, in fact, has taken a fair amount of money from the savings and loans and the banking industry over the years. It's something we're burdened with. We do have to go after the people who, who were crooks, I think, who stole the money. They must be found, prosecuted, and put in jail as a witness, as witness to the next people who might do the same. And we must make sure we don't pay out more than we have to. There's a $100,000 insurance limit. We shouldn't go above that limit. And we should make sure we re-regulate that industry so that they somehow aren't allowed to do it again. We need regulation in that important industry. Vivian? You have taken positions on two state energy projects. You oppose the building of the Salt Caves project, and you support the continuation of Trojan. Given that Oregon and the Northwest require new energy resources, how would you meet future regional needs? On Salt Caves, I believe for the, for the good of South Central Oregon, that project is not favorable. It would, it would essentially destroy a major part of the Klamath River, which is a major tourist attraction for South Central uh, Oregon. I believe we should keep that. We don't need that minuscule amount of power that that project would produce. And I think the environmental community I I is as one in opposing it. Most Oregonians are opposed to it. On the subject of Trojan, I believe I've not found Trojan to be unsafe. If I felt it was unsafe, I would vote like everyone else would in those circumstances to shut Trojan down. I don't believe it is unsafe. What most Oregonians are concerned about with respect to Trojan, I believe, is long-term repository for high-level waste. And we must get on with finding a solution to that problem. The deadline right now, I believe, is the year 2005 for, for solving that problem. We put a man on the moon in like eight years. It shouldn't take us 15 more years to find a high-level waste repository. We must shorten that deadline and find a repository for those high-level waste, not just for Trojan, for all the reactors across the United States. Marge. Senator Hatfield's position as ranking minority member on the Appropriations Committee has given him the clout to secure 75% UMTA funding for the West Side Light Rail Project. Given the unlikelihood that, the, unlikelihood that you as a freshman senator would be appointed to the Appropriations Committee, what would you do to ensure that continued funding for the West Side gets through Congress and past the opposition of UMTA? Well, of course, it may get approved this year. That's unlikely, I guess. It'll more likely happen next year. And it's not, it's not a foregone conclusion that I will not be a member of the Appropriations Committee. It would be my first choice, as a matter of fact. And uh, George Mitchell has said, if I can unseat Mr. Hatfield, I can probably have my choice of positions in the U.S. <laughs> in the US Senate. I'm very much in favor of the West Side Light Rail, by the way. We need it. The East Side Light Rail, the MAX system, has been very effective. We all know that. Not just in reducing crowds on the band field and in the future on, on, the, on the West Side uh, highways, but, but in terms of reducing pollution and saving our atmosphere, we need mass transit systems all across the country, not just here in Portland. I'm very much in favor of that. I would do whatever I can to make sure the light rail arrived here with, with funding for it. Vivian? You have criticized Senator Hatfield for voting to cut or freeze Social Security cost of living increases, yet Social Security recipients recover their entire contributions within just a few years and current taxpayers have to pay for the remaining benefits. Also, many Social Security beneficiaries don't even need Social Security payments. How would you reform Social Security to avoid the problem of a shrinking base of Social Security taxpayers and an expanding base of Social Security recipients. I don't think we should reduce COLAs at all, the so-called cost of living allowance increases. I think we need those. I've talked to a number of people across this state at senior centers everywhere. I've had lunch at I don't know how many senior centers. And by the way, I can tell you, they don't eat as well as we did today for lunch. I can guarantee you that. They don't eat well at all, in my opinion. So we must, have, must maintain what we've got and perhaps even do better 
for our seniors in this country. It's a swelling po portion of our population. We must make sure they're provided for. I'm in favor of cost of living allowances, and Mark Hatfield, I believe, I believe has voted for, against them something like 10 times in the last 10 years. I think that's a mistake. We must continue to take care of our seniors. The Moynihan bill, I think, has, has a good part and a bad part to it. We should take the Social Security system off budget and make sure those dollars are there. The bad part would be to reduce contributions to it. I think we must maintain those contributions to make sure that the Social Security system is intact forever. Marge? The President and key congressional leaders are holding budget summit talks to find new revenues or raise taxes. If you were part of that summit, what new taxes or other means of raising revenues would you push for? Yeah. By the way, I, I'm not sure we know where Mr. Hatfield stands on the budget deficit. He's not here to tell us today. I wish he were. My own feeling is that the, the, the deficit is completely out of hand. This debt is something we may never pay off. Our grandchildren may never pay it off. The politicians in Washington just haven't had the courage to do what it takes, either raise taxes or lower expenditures. I would go there with that courage, I guarantee you. The first place I would look for is in the military, particularly these very expensive, sophisticated systems that I believe we no longer need with the end of the Cold War. I refer here to the MX system, Star Wars, B1 and B2. All of that, I believe, with the end of the Cold War last year, is superfluous. And I would cut those things out very, very quickly. We do need, of course, a strong land, sea, and air force, as evidenced by the events in the Middle East right now. But there's a lot of fat in the military. It's the first place I would look for cutting the budget. I'm not sure we have to raise taxes. We should cut military expenditures, number one, over the next five or ten years to bring them into line with what we really need in this country. Vivian? During the Reagan administration, the funds for many domestic programs were reduced. Given limited federal resources, what three programs would you vote to have reinstated and why? Hmm. That's a tough one. I'm not sure I'd reinstate. I think we need medical care for every American citizen. That's the first thing I would look for in terms of new programs. Medical care. We, we absolutely have to have that. The rest of the world has it. Why don't we? We also must put major emphasis on education. George Bush, when he was running, called himself the education president. It's bunk. I mean, the guy reduced the education budget by 2% in real dollars in his, first, in his first year in office. We must put much greater emphasis on education than we have in the last 10 years in this country. We are falling behind the industrialized world. We just can't allow, to, we can't allow that to continue. So those would be my two priorities, medical care and education. I think the place is for us to put our dollars. You know, Mark Hatfield has said has brought pork back to Oregon. Part of the pork he's brought back is something called the Elk Creek Dam, a $120 million boondoggle. That money would have looked very great here at making Portland State University into a major research university. It's things like that I think we need, not Elk Creek Dam. Marge? You are opposed to campaign funding by PACs but you are lucky enough to be able to finance a good portion of your campaign with your own funds. What system of campaign funding would you construct for candidates who can't bankroll their own campaigns? Thanks, Marge. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's driving me broke, I can tell you. <laughs> um, as I said in my opening remarks, we desperately need campaign finance reform in this country. I've toured this state from Baker City to Brookings, from Astoria to Ashland, and I've met, I can't tell you how many people that I would be happy to have represent me back in Washington. And they can't get there, and they won't get there because they aren't millionaires. And that's a pity. I think we need to open up the whole political process to bright people who love this country, who want to go to work for this country back in Washington. Yes, it's true I happen to have some bucks. Most people don't happen to have some bucks. What we desperately need, I believe, is free television in this country. Where I'm spending most of my money, where all candidates spend their money, is on television time. I believe it's true, I think the New York Times reported just six weeks ago, that only three countries in the world don't provide free television time for their major political candidates. The United States, Norway, and Sri Lanka. Now, <laughs> now why are we in that mess? I mean, why can't we tell those stations who get their privilege of, of broadcasting from the federal government, from the FCC, you must provide free television time for the candidates. That would reduce expenditures by a factor of 10. That's what we need. Vivian? As a scientist, you have been involved in developing new technologies. Many observers have noted that America has been the inventor of technology, while it has been other countries, notably Japan, that have taken advantage of America's inventions to develop useful and exportable products. How can America reverse this trend so that we can take advantage of our technological inventiveness to develop practical and profitable products? Yeah. 
Good point. We are falling behind, not just the Japanese, but so many other countries as well. And we do have the brain power. And we do have a wonderful university education system in this country. We, pro we provide not quite universal education that is uh, beyond secondary education. We do better than any other country in the world in providing university educations for our, for our people. But we've, we've done a couple of things. We've not remain, remain competitive in terms of technology, even with the Japanese. The Japanese work extremely hard. They're the most loyal, dedicated, hardworking people in the world. I've been there. I know what it's like to deal with the Japanese. They're very, very tough negotiators. They have been with me and my company. They're the toughest negotiators in the world. We must be equally tough in negotiating with them. We must continue to put more emphasis on education and research in this country. Small research, not just super colliders, but the small research that the National Science Foundation needs. We must remain competitive with them. The way to do that, I think, is, is to re-inspire this country of ours. People now are disenchanted with what they see going on back in Washington. They think, aren't, they think things aren't working well for the country. I think we have a sort of a malaise across the country. We must get back in there and pitch, I believe. Marge? The Middle East crisis has once again focused attention on our nation's lack of an energy conservation policy and our failure to reduce our oil consumption. What would the elements of your energy policy be? You know, we had a good thing going in, in, in the Carter years. In the, in the 1970s, while we didn't have a major program in each area, we had programs in energy conservation and new energy sources. In the Reagan years, we let both of those programs slide. We became fat cats again, importing lots and lots of foreign oil. We're, I think we're importing as much foreign oil right now as we ever have in our future. We must go back to those days. We must go back first to energy conservation, insulate our homes better, provide better mileage in our cars. Senator Bryan from, from Nevada has introduced a bill into the Senate that would increase the gas mileage in all American cars, such as some of them would be getting 40 miles per gallon. We need that, not just to produce, not just to reduce emissions, but to get to get ourselves off this oil kick we're on with the Middle East. If we did that one measure alone, we would reduce our, our oil consumption by more than we now import from the Persian Gulf countries. We must do that. We must conserve, and we need new energy sources. The Solar Energy Research Institute in Colorado was a great idea, but their budget was cut in half in the, in the Reagan years. The ultimate source of energy has to be the sun. We must go back to doing research in that area. Vivian? You've called for reconciliation between environmental and timber interests. Can this call for reconciliation be interpreted as relaxing strict protection of the spotted owl under the Endangered Species Protection Act in return for concessions by timber interests? I don't think so. Perhaps the thing that triggered me more than anything else to enter this race is what I see happening to our ancient forests on public land. And I ask those in the audience as you leave, we have a large picture out in the hall of what's left of the Mount Hood National Forest. It's, it's an aerial photograph that covers miles and miles, much of which is clear cuts. I call your attention to that photograph. It's a shocking picture. I hope it shocks you as much as it does me. I believe the answer to the problem is twofold. First, we must stop exports of every stick of timber, including private timber. I'm not much for reducing private initiative, but as long as we're about to lose jobs in Oregon for lack of a supply of timber, we must keep that timber here starting as soon as we can. Secondly, we need new value-added products in our timber-dependent communities. We need things like we haven't been. Posey Window, the largest employer in my town, makes high-quality wooden doors and windows. They have 1,600 employees. 20 years ago, they had 25. They're the largest employer, I think, the largest manufacturing employer east of the Cascades. We need companies like that all across our state. We may need low interest rate loans to encourage them, but we must have forward integrate, make more value-added products, and solve this long-term problem by means other than continuing to cut those irreplaceable ancient forests. Marge will ask the last question from the panel, and then we will take questions from club members at the mic on the floor. Marge? You're a strong pro-choice proponent and have said that you believe women and minorities are still treated unfairly in this country. What specific reforms would you make that would advance the cause of women and minorities? Another good question. Um, it is true I don't believe women get a fair shake. I mean, they've, they've, certainly, they've certainly pulled themselves up by their bootstraps in the last 10 or 20 years. And women, I'm proud of you. Keep it up. Uh, I think it's a wonderful thing you're doing. For all of us, so not just for women, for men as well. We, I think we all appreciate it and we, and we encourage you to do more. We must somehow reactivate and pass the Equal Rights Amendment. How that failed to pass, I don't know, but it did. I would work hard to get that thing passed. I think we need e equal opportunity everywhere in our country, regardless of sex, 
uh, religion, uh, color of skin, whatever you name it, we need equal opportunity. And I would work try hard to try to make that happen. I, I think women have done, as I said, a wonderful job. I encourage them to keep at it. Don't give up. Most of the enlightened men in this country are with you. We want to see you have equal status with us and maybe help carry this burden for the next hundred years. <laughs> Thank you. Questions from the floor? Steve Shane, a City Club member. Uh, Mr. Lonsdale, you made uh, some comments in regards in your opening uh, remarks about Senator Hatfield's 24 years in the Senate. Would you, uh, and if you do, would, do you support any limitation on the on federally elected uh, uh, office, the amount of times, uh, the terms that a, a senator or a representative or even the president can serve? I do favor a limitation on terms. You know, we already have a limitation on terms in the presidency. I think 12 years, two terms for a Senate senator is plenty. We do need fresh blood. Mark Hatfield himself thought so once upon a time. I want to, I brought a little quote that he said back in 1971 when he was running for his second term. He said, in large measure, the debilitating inadequacies of the Congress stem from the inordinate tenure of many of its members. <laughs> there, there's more. <laughs> One way to ensure that new and young blood enters the national legislative arena is to limit the terms of senators to two terms. He's now running for his fifth, as you know, and I happen to agree with him, two terms is plenty. 12 years for the House, maybe even less, I'm sorry, 12 years for the Senate, six terms or three four-year terms for the House would be adequate as well, I believe. We need new blood. Margaret Donsbach, City Club member. Uh, as you may know, Senator Hatfield was extremely influential in achieving protection for the Columbia River Gorge, now National Scenic Area. What is your position on protection for the gorge and uh, do you believe you would have a role, if you are elected, in continuing that protection? I'm all for it. I consider myself an environmentalist. I, I like, the reason I live in Oregon is I think it's the finest place to live in the United States. I've traveled extensively. I feel I know Oregon well. I chose Oregon. I wasn't born here. I moved here. And I moved here because of the quality of life. And I think that's what's going to make Oregon sustain and survive and, and thrive over the years, is maintaining that quality of life. I'm all for protecting the Columbia River Gorge. I would do whatever I can to make sure it wasn't invaded. There are problems with, re with reducing power by any means. Coal, oil, gas, all pollute. All, in fact, increase global warming. Dams have their problems, as we know uh, now with the salmon. There is no totally free way of generating power. Each one has its own risks. I don't find, uh, as I say, Trojan either unsafe, and I, I believe we must find some way to store that, long, that waste in long term. I think we will. You know, it only took us, as I said, eight years to put a man on the moon. It shouldn't take 15 years to find a storage repository for high-level wastes. Ivan Goddard, member. In this day of sound bites, smear campaigns, and invisible debaters, uh, <laughs> so many of the American electorate have gotten turned off by the whole process that we, we in America have the lowest turnout of any of the developed countries. One of the eye-opening things about the recent uh, events in the, the East Bloc is how so many unopposed machine candidates were voted out when they finally came to uh, the test in the Soviet elections. Do you support, would you introduce legislation so that we as well as Soviets can register our disgust with the process and distaste for the candidates by voting for none of the above? <laughs> yes. <laughs> As you may know, there's a higher turnover in the Politburo than there is the United States Congress. I find that just disgusting. <laughs> Question. Sarah Gaben, member. Can you tell us how, you're, how you think your position of refusing to accept PAC money will affect your chances of winning? Hmm. Well, it may inf it'll, it'll probably both increase and decrease my chances of winning. First of all, it costs me in the pocketbook We've actually sent back some PAC checks because we aren't accepting any. On the other hand, I believe Oregonians are sick and tired of special interest PAC contributions. I've, I've picked that up all across this state. It's bothered me for years. What I find is I'm not the only one that, that's bothered. I happen to have with me, it turns out, the Federal Election Commission's report on Mark Hatfield's PAC contributions over the last 10 years or so. It's about an inch thick. Here it is, folks. It's long. Yeah. <laughs> it's long. These are Mark Hatfield's contributions. I 
can't even pick it all up. These are his contributions in the last 10 years or so, not even including, by the way, 1990. We need to end that system. Mark, what are you doing with all that money, I ask? Uh, Terry Bristol, member. Uh, Harry, a lot of people are impressed by Mark Hatfield's ability to bring home the bacon, but I'm concerned that he doesn't bring it home in the right places. And in particular, after, with 24 years in the Senate, uh, he's failed miserably to support the development of an urban university in Portland. Uh, Harry, you're a member of the high-tech community, as I am. Uh, you're aware that uh, I think just recently we've lost our third competition for attracting high-tech companies into the Portland area. <clears throat> and they all cited the same reason was our lack of a major urban university. Uh, can you give some comments about how you would uh, change the, your, the <laughs> position on Portland State? Thanks for your question. I'm delighted to see that Judy Romley, who I've not met yet, I'm sorry, sits here in the front row. Pardon? <laughs> 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 Judy, it's good to have you. I've heard, read wonderful things about you in the newspaper, and I'm sure that and more is true. I look forward to your tenure here. We do need a strong urban university in the Portland area. Um, and Mark Hatfield's done very little, perhaps nothing, to make that happen. He was one of the starters in the Oregon Graduate Institute, which has not, in fact, blossomed as the way I think he and others envisioned it would. I think we need to put major emphasis on this university here. Judy, I know you're up to that. I'm behind it. I want to see this, this city become the city it could be, which it lacks, as you know. Those in the audience are, are aware of the fact that we've lost some major federal projects because we don't have a major urban university here in Portland. We must have that. I will do whatever I can to see that it happens. Uh, Mr. Lonsdale, my question is about a minute long. Is that all right? I'm not the timekeeper. We'd like for you to give it to us as quickly as you can, Greg. I shall. Thank you. Uh, Gregory Kufori, Mr. Lonsdale. In the last year, uh, many opinion leaders have changed their mind on the Trojan nuclear plant. The Oregonian last October called Trojan a disgrace and said that its safety record was one of the worst. The Daily Astorian recently said that PGE's management of the Trojan plant has been reprehensible. The Business Journal recently said that Trojan had been run with the intelligence of a telephone post. Given that this plant is only 3% of the integrated Northwest system, given that many intelligent people like yourselves are changing their mind on Trojan, given that we have a long campaign ahead of us, do you still have an open mind? <laughs> Greg and I had breakfast. <laughs> Greg and I had breakfast about three or four months ago when he had my arm well up behind my back on that question. Greg, I do have an open mind. Uh, I feel whatever the voters decide on November 6th will certainly be binding on me. I will go whatever, whatever way the voters want to go. But I am a scientist. I once, in fact, had some association with the nuclear power industry. We have nuclear power all across the United States. I believe one-sixth of all power generated in this country right now is nuclear. It must be safe. I'm as concerned about safety as anyone in this audience. I have an open mind. If I were convinced it were unsafe, I would want to shut it down tomorrow. No doubt about it. Earthquake proof or whatever you name, if it can be proven that the thing is unsafe, I'm for shutting it down. Right now, I just haven't seen the evidence as sufficiently convincing as I need to change my mind on that one. Ed Christie, member. Uh, Mr. Lonsdale, you have stated on several occasions and, and also today that you uh, would like to see all old growth uh, uh, stopped and also a suspension of, uh, of export logs. Um, there are thousands of large and small landowners uh, in the uh, state and uh, who make their living on this. How do you propose that these landowners be compensated, or would you propose that they are not compensated at all? Thank you. Um, you know, I think Peter DeFazio is about to introduce a bill either today or Monday into the U.S. House dealing with private woodlot owners, small private woodlot owners, not George Weyerhaeuser, by the way. And I like the DeFazio bill. He, in fact, would allow private woodlot owners to export. I'm not sure that's such a bad idea. What concerns me is warehouser exporting all these logs from, from the Coos Bay area that could be used for our mills here in Oregon. So I think we perhaps should make an exception for private woodlot owners. Private woodlot owners, as you may not know, th those of you in Portland, have a tough go of it. They're competing against federal timber, which we subsidize the cost of. Federal timber is sold dirt cheap. When the feds put up a timber sale, they somehow don't factor in what the trees themselves cost. They figure out the cost of the roads and the cost of putting up the sale, but they put no value whatsoever on those trees. Well, you can't grow trees for nothing if you have to plant them yourself. 
And private woodlot owners, in fact, do operate on a sustained yield basis. I'm proud of them. I like what they do. We must somehow raise, I believe, the, the cost of federal timber so the private woodlot owners can compete. Uh, Mr. Lonsdale. Jim Carlson, City Club member. As a follow-up to your answer indicating your opposition to freezing Social Security colas, I'd like to run another idea by you. Uh, each month in this uh, country, we send out over a half million dollars, so, uh, over half million Social Security checks to millionaires in this country. The money for those checks comes out of the pockets of working Americans who don't have anywhere near those amount of resources. What is your position on means testing of Social Security benefits? I haven't studied that one in detail, but I believe I'm opposed to means testing. I think the people who collect those dollars, in fact, paid into the system themselves, I think they're entitled to get their money back. Jerry Kogan Club member, what is your opinion of Mark Hatfield's proposal to uh, uh, provide uh, capital gains tax incentives to private timber companies to uh, keep them from exporting logs? Big mistake. Uh, in fact, I'm against the I'm against uh, capital gains tax reductions in general. Th this country, speaking about capital gains taxes, this country, as you read in the newspaper, is more polarized now than at any time, at least at least in modern history, perhaps ever. The rich really have gotten richer. I mean, the top one percent of Americans own more than the bottom 100 million. I mean, how can we let that happen in this country we call free and democratic? It seems to me we've given too many tax breaks already. Hatfield's proposal, at which you may not know would attempt to ban the export of raw logs by providing a tax incentive to, say, George Weyerhaeuser, to keep the logs here. It doesn't work. First of all, the tax break is much smaller than the price differential between the domestic price and the overseas price. So what he would do is just give more money to George Weyerhaeuser to keep the logs here he's already keeping here. George Weyerhaeuser is doing just fine, thank you. That company made, I believe, $700 million in profit last year. They don't need more help from us. Craig Oldham, sir, City Club member. I'm concerned these days about statewide ballot measure seven. That is a measure that would essentially destroy um, welfare, unemployment, and food stamp programs in certain counties in this state and put all of the clients of those programs to work at less than minimum wage and assign jobs. Um, in order to go into effect, this uh, um, ballot measure would require uh, extensive waivers of some federal legislation that is just now getting ready to go into effect after years and years and years of planning. Um, I would like to know what your position is on that and why. As I understand Proposition 7, I'm opposed to it. It's a state measure, not a federal measure actually, but I'm opposed to it. Uh, the, this, the general concept of workfare, that is uh, reducing welfare payments and direct handouts to people, I'm for. I don't like handouts. I'm a businessman. I think we somehow must balance the books internally in this country. So the people who are willing and able to work for their welfare payments should, should work, I believe. But there are many people who aren't willing and able to work. We must somehow provide a safety net under them, under those people, to make sure that they are provided for as well. But I think Proposition 7 is not the way to do that. Jim Meyer, a member of the City Club. As you know, in recent years, high technology companies have played a larger and larger role in the Oregon economy. How do you think that fact should influence our attitudes about timber policies? Well, I think high tech has been extremely kind to the Portland metropolitan area. This, this area, as you know, is, is perhaps the most prosperous area of the state. It must be. I've traveled it extensively. We're doing better here than probably anywhere else in the state. We do need more high tech. And uh, as for the impact on the timber industry, I believe it must forward integrate in, in the jargon of business and make more value-added products. Well, what we do now is we ship logs to Japan, or at best we might ship dimension lumber overseas. We've got to make value-added products. We have to make wooden doors and windows, as the company in my town does. We've got to make modular homes. I'm told there's a major market for modular, American-made modular homes in Japan. Why aren't we filling that market? We should be. We should be selling furniture. We shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be exporting logs or even dimension lumber. We should be exporting our products. And I believe that, that very vital industry that the wood products industry in our state must modernize. If it can't do it on its own, perhaps the feds should help them through some low interest rate loans. I'm not sure we need that, but if it comes to that, I think we may have to do that. Harry, I'm David Cooper, member. And I wonder, uh, my question relates to technology also. Um, I wonder if you could provide a little bit more information about some of the spin-offs 
of banned research. Um, you alluded to them just briefly before. Yes, we have spun off a couple of companies from our own company uh, in Bend. I'm very proud of that, by the way. The one I could perhaps, perhaps speak most fluently about is one called Concept. It makes a variety of non-toxic pest control products. And the one I'll tout, since it's not sold here and I'm not trying to sell you any of our stuff, the one I will tout is, uh, is a, a, a product for controlling the pink bollworm in cotton. It happens to be the most destructive pest in the United States. And we last summer treated 30,000 acres of Arizona cotton. This summer we're treating 50,000 acres of Arizona cotton with this product. It's based on the use of pheromones, which are chemicals that insects themselves secrete to communicate with one another. And we've found ways to encapsulate pheromones and distribute them across cotton fields so that insects don't find one another, don't mate, don't reproduce, and don't infect the bulls. We think that this non-toxic pest control whole line of products is the wave of the future. Rachel Carson would have loved it if she were still around. We think that we must control pests, but we have to do it without toxic pesticides. And this company we've started, Concept, is doing extremely well in that area. They will have sales of like $20 million this year. I'm very proud of that company. Uh, Pete Bear, member, we've uh, heard a lot about the forest industry today, and we tend to focus on old growth, new growth, the spotted owl, log exports, clear cutting. But on a recent trip to uh, the Bend area uh, on vacation, I'm wondering if maybe the debate isn't misfocused or if there isn't another important problem. And that is, there's a lot of beetle kill over there, and there's a uh, spruce worm apparently that's uh, literally turning our forests from green to red. In light of your uh, last question, uh, and in light of the fact that you may be an incoming freshman senator, what would you do both through the federal government and private industry to make sure that the insects don't devastate our forests? Well, we need more products like I believe one of the companies we've started is developing, that is non-toxic pest control products to make sure that beetle kill doesn't happen in the future. I believe we just need better management of our forests. You know, we've all been sort of sucked in by Smokey the Bear and we've all become sort of fans of the Forest Service. I've lost some of my love for the Forest Service over the years. I don't think they are good custodians of our forests. I'm not criticizing them overall, but when I, look, when I fly across the Cascades, which I do a lot because I live in Central Oregon, I, and when I want to travel, I come through Portland Airport. When I fly across the Cascades, I tell myself, somebody has made a big mess out there. That's somebody for my money is Mark Hatfield, and that picture I have out in the hall is, is my feeling is Mark Hatfield's 24-year legacy to all of us. We must stop that and stop it as quickly as we can. This will be our last question. Sue Graham, City Club member. I've heard you've proposed an idea for something called an Earth Corps, which would be not just local, but national and perhaps global. I'd like to hear some more details about that. It's a relatively new idea. Uh, a number of people have suggested it, not just myself. The Earth Corps is sort of a modern day equivalent of the Peace Corps. It's aimed pr principally at young people, those who might in fact be tempted by crime someday, to get them off the streets and doing something good not for peace around the world, because peace seems to have broken out, but rather for the environment. Let's clean up, let's restore, let's make this country beautiful again in the places where it isn't beautiful right now. And that's many, many places if you've traveled this country as I have. So the, 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 the Earth Corps is a way to take young people, let them do something constructive for this country, increase their allegiance to this country, which many of them have in a very fuzzy kind of a way, increase their allegiance, let them do something good for this country, and perhaps provide them with something like the GI Bill. For a year or two of service, they might, they might get themselves a year or two or perhaps a full four-year college education. I think something like that, programs like that, are, are, are two or three-edged. First, it does something good for those kids, and it does something good for our country, also something good for our environment. I think all three of those need something, need some help. I'm sorry, Ray. We're going to have to have Mr. Lonsdale's closing now. Seem after the program to ask your question. Mr. Lonsdale. Thank you. Before we leave today, I want to again thank the City Club of Portland for having me here. I also want to say to Mr. Hatfield, I'm willing to debate you, sir, any time, any place in this state, before any audience. Mark, please come out and debate. I spoke earlier of a time 24 years ago when Mark Hatfield left Oregon to go to Washington, D.C. But there's another important date that we should also remember, a day that happened 22 years ago before this very same body, the City Club of Portland. 22 years ago, a great Oregon Senator, Wayne Morse, 
faced his opponent in a debate before this very club. Senator Morris was a maverick. He was a man who was once highly respected for his independence, but he was also a 24-year incumbent. He faced a younger opponent who was an underdog. That man was Bob Packwood, and some of you in this very audience may have been there for that debate. That day, 22 years ago, when Wayne Morris debated Bob Packwood was a turning point in the race for the Senate that year. The Packwood campaign took off, and Wayne Morris never recovered. I think that this year, 1990, Oregon faces a similar historic moment. A moment again when Oregon is ready to discard the past, the tired ways of the past, and step boldly into the future. You know, at least then, Wayne Morris realized that he still had to hold himself accountable to his constituents by coming to a debate. At least Wayne Morris cared enough to come. Now, however, we have another 24-year incumbent, Mark Hatfield, who's forgotten that he has an obligation to listen, to listen to you, his constituents. I'd like to read you, a, read you all a quote from a book that Mark Hatfield wrote in 1968, the same year of the Morris-Packwood debate. The book is called Not Quite So Simple, and the quote goes as follows. I pattern my speeches after the approach I used in the classroom. This approach was based on the premise that there is room for debate. I make a statement of my views on a given issue and then submit this view to the challenge of a question and answer period. By constantly exposing myself to this challenge, I hope to help assure myself against the arrogant slide into self-assurance that never questions basic premises and that is never modified by changing events and circumstances. <laughs> Effective debate in the political arena requires that the spokesman of various views present those views honestly. Now Mark, you wrote those words yourself and you believed in them once. Where are you today? Where are you for the women of Oregon who may soon be denied the fundamental right to a safe and legal abortion without the threat of government intervention? Where are you for our timber workers who are seeing their way of life die while we continue to export our logs so that George Weyerhaeuser and company can grow richer? Where are you for all Oregonians who care about our precious quality of life and are tired of the never-ending short-sighted assault on our environment? Where are you for the thousands of citizens who are fed up with special interests controlling the politicians in Washington and burdening us with SNL bailouts, tax increases, and budget deficits? Where are you for Oregon? We here in Oregon recognize that our next senator must understand that we have a responsibility to be the conscience of the world, to build for the future, to bring those who would rob the public treasury to justice, to steward the environment, not for the convenience of big business, but for the enhancement of all people. And to protect the lives of women and the civil liberties of us all by protecting the right of choice. That's what this election is all about. We need someone to fight for the rest of us. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.